I recently sat down with Matthew Napoli, uh, creator of Breath, over on my Twitch channel, where we discussed what Breath is and why you'd want to host PHP applications on AWS Lambda in the first place. We talked about how to create um, new applications, taking advantage of sort of the serverless uh, microservices architecture, but also how to use Breath to host an existing full stack sort of monolith framework based application, maybe maybe a Laravel app or a Symfony app. So yeah, take a look and let me know what you think. We'll be doing more of these uh, in the future. We'll have more content from this stream coming out, including uh, full technical instructions on how to host your Laravel app on AWS Lambda with Breath. So take a look and I hope you enjoy. So with me today is Matteo Napoli, maintainer of Breath, friend of mine, and I'm super excited to try and to try and do this. How are you doing? Yeah, but pretty great. Pretty excited. That's, I'm glad to hear it. I'm really glad to hear it. So, yeah, I guess um, it's worth you running us through what Breath is initially, right? To to try and figure out what you know what's what's going on and what's what here. Um, so Breath is an open source project that I created. I think it was about three years ago now. Um, and the goal with the project is to help developers run their applications online. Um, and does that through uh, serverless applications. So Breath helps you create serverless PHP applications. Um, it, it's not like a framework. It is compatible with Symfony, with Laravel, so you can keep using the technologies you are used to. Uh, it will provide what you need to run your application on AWS, and more specifically on the AWS Lambda. I think like we've we've had a chat about this a number of times, right? We've hung out and we've had a chat because this stuff is really exciting to me. I kind of came from a background of working with JavaScript and, and AWS. We were fully in bed when I was at the BBC with AWS. We used um, Lambda and all of the good stuff. So I love this stuff. But there's kind of, I mean, in our conversations, we kind of figured out that there's kind of two sides to this story, right? There's using AWS lambdas and AWS infrastructure kind of as it's designed with like a serverless architecture and microservices and all these beautiful buzzwords from the, from the modern era. And then there's just like using AWS lambda as a cheap web host, which is a thing that you totally can do and is super powerful, right? Exactly, yes. And that's, uh, uh, that's actually something that we discussed together. Yeah. Um, that's to me. That's a really interesting topic. Um, when you use, you know, when you use any other language on AWS Lambda, you have you cannot have to change your application. You have to change the way you think about creating web applications. And with PHP, we have an opportunity that's really special uh, because PHP, um, in its execution model, is really compatible with the way AWS Lambda works. So um, yes, we can create with PHP. Stuff just like in Java, in in Node.js, in Python, we can create microservices built with um, you know event-driven services, um, and that's really cool and that's useful for some use cases. But we can also use AWS Lambda as a very simple web hosting platform. Uh, so we can take Laravel and Symfony and just put them on Lambda, do a quick configuration thing that we're going to see today, and uh, hopefully it just runs and that's one less server to manage. So the biggest problem that's always been, it's always been a problem with Lambda, always, and people always complain about it. And that's like the, the, the cold starts, right? The spin up rate. So how Lambda works is if we look at AWS, is it's like, so if you don't know what Lambda is, Lambda is essentially a function as a service provided by AWS, right? It's you, you throw some code up into this, runtime and then you invoke the code via whatever means you need typically you'll invoke it as like a hit with a http request but you can invoke it in well i think it, it's only invoked via http request unless you're invoking it via internal aws mechanisms right i don't think there's any way to invoke it outside of uh aws uh, i mean you, you can invoke lambda manually or through uh, like the php sdk yeah. you can invoke lambda through php but essentially under the hood that's doing a http request to the lambda right i think so i think uh, it's actually more complex than that oh so you have, cool like, um yeah there's like the what's called the lambda api um which is very you know it's an aws api it's very specific and um you can invoke that manually that's like the core api of lambda and actually, when you use HTTP, you use API Gateway, 
um, which is pretty easy to set up um, with serverless.yaml. But anyway, you use API Gateway, and API Gateway actually uses the internal Lambda API, I mean the AWS API, to forward HTTP requests to Lambda. So all in all, if you use API Gateway or if you use queues, um, if you integrate with Amazon S3, any any integration that you want to use will actually use the the Lambda HTTP. Uh, I mean the Lambda, right. I say like the internal API, even though it's available uh, publicly. Yeah, I mean, this, so this is kind of what it looks like when you set up a Lambda on AWS. Like you can see the trigger here is an API gateway, but we could add any kind of trigger. So this code is PHP, right? And we can trigger it through HTTP if we wanted to, but we can totally trigger it through any of these multitude of ways that you can trigger it. Like you could trigger it through um, API gateway, which is a HTTP request, like SQS, uh, SNS, SQS, which is Lambda's queues, SNS, which is Lambda's like internal messaging system. So yeah, we there's a million ways, but we, we t so going back to the original point, there's two ways that this can be used. It can be used as a, I want to build a new uh, application or I want to modify an existing application to be more microservices-y, to be more, um, to, take, to take more advantage of Lambda's, of AWS's infrastructure and all of their amazing offerings, because they do have amazing offerings, which is why so many companies build on AWS, right? It's, this infrastructure is unbelievable. I mean, all of Twilio is built on it where I work. You look at like, I went to um, serverless days in Cardiff where the head developer for Lego's e-commerce shop were talking about how they got in bed with with AWS and went serverless. And whatever way you, whatever way you slice it, this infrastructure for hosting applications is amazing, right? So, yeah, there's no question there. But, but that's one, that's one way. The other way is like this Lambda is amazing for a free web host, a free, because it's got such a generous free tier. Like you, I think it's over, is it a million invocations of a Lambda a month is the free level? Yeah, it is 1 million, I think so, yeah. So essentially because Lambda is, so serverless stuff functions as a service. If you come from something like Node or maybe Python, a less traditional web application environment, it can be really difficult to get into this. When I was working at the BBC and we were running Node, shared nothing architecture was very difficult concept for people in JavaScript to get their head around because they'd been working in Node where they can load something into memory and it's available in every event in the event loop. And then they were trying to do the same thing here and trying to explain to them, look, Lambdas, they are not persistent. They're thrown away and they're, they're spun up constantly. So you can't rely on stuff being available is difficult, but in PHP land, it's what we've been doing for however long we've been doing it, right? So exactly. we're uniquely placed to take advantage of this. We'll take a look now, but I, I'm i certainly intrigued in building PHP-based websites on AWS infrastructure, but I'm also highly intrigued about how this can be used as a scalable f web host with a generous free to you. Um, so you've hosted t uh, a number of websites on Lambda using Breath uh, up to this point, right? Yeah, I now I use it for every one of my websites, really. I may have like five or six just personal websites or you know, site projects. Um, and now that's my default go-to. Awesome. And do you use this for your, for your clients and customers or is this like all just sort of uh, personal stuff? Yeah, no, I do. I do. Um, for example, the latest project I did was a Symfony application. Uh, nothing special, just a database, Symfony, a few files to upload, and the rest was just business logic written in PHP. So that was just perfect with Lambda. Um, yeah. We, yeah, we, we, once that's configured, you don't see anything right. different than any other server, to be honest. So there's a great question in chat, and I think that we totally have to um address is the question from uh de niro is is there still a max execution time of 30 seconds in uh in lambda um and smbbls says 20 i don't know how to pronounce your name i'm sorry says uh 15 minutes but yeah i guess we have to address that right because these are throwaways so there is spin up time so how have you found that yeah no that's a great question um 
It is uh, 30 seconds for HTTP requests. So it's very similar to uh, what you could set up with you know, the PHP max execution time or execution limit. I'm not sure of the name. But 30 seconds for HTTP requests, usually it's perfectly fine because you, you don't really want to have any requests longer than that. Uh, and then you have uh, indeed 15 minutes maximum for non-HTTP requests. So that usually is the case for SQS, I mean, queue jobs, queue workers, or cron tasks. If you have something that's longer than that, you, usually either you split it or you don't use AWS Lambda for that. The biggest perceived problem with using Lambda as a generous free tier web host is the fact that you do have to deal with cold starts, right? There, there is there is a problem or a perceived problem where lambdas are not so the, the the reason that lambda is so generous with its free tier and the reason it's so cheap even if you hit the free tier is like any function as a service the lambdas are not sitting there up and running waiting for requests constantly right if you don't get any traffic between 9 p.m and 9 a.m there's no lambdas there's no functions that are sitting there waiting to respond to web requests they that cpu time is potentially being used for somebody else so so the, the, that's the reason that this can be such an amazingly cheap way to host applications. But it also means that that first request could potentially have a cold start, which means it can be a slower request than subsequent requests, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's like the time for the... I, I like to say containers. Those aren't really containers, yeah. but uh, people get the point with containers. It's like the time for the container to start. Um, and Or scale up. If you have like a huge yeah. traffic increase in a few minutes, you will have an increase in the number of containers running for your website. So you will have what's called a cold start. And um, I think people fear this kind of thing massively because they, they feel like, oh, it could be like an awful amount of time. But I mean, we discussed this. You 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 told me some of the like real world. Are you OK to share like some of the real world examples of how cold starts affect your actual applications that are running? Yeah. Um, on all my websites that do receive a little bit of traffic, usually cold starts um, are for like 0.5 percent of all the requests I get. Um, so this is not zero, obviously. You you have to expect cold starts to happen, uh, but it's still a small fraction of the visitors of your website that could see those. Mm. Um, what I usually find is that it's for websites, it's not really a big deal. I mean. Um, it depends on the website that you are building, of course. But um, for the clients I, w I was working lately, we were building a back office application. And you know, having a cold start of a few hundred milliseconds, uh, the first time of the day that you were using the application, that was, I mean, that's really nothing. You don't really care. And the other way I like to think about it is that the cold starts are, are the worst delay that you could get. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> If you have an application that and, and you suddenly get a lot of requests at some point, um, if you were using a server, either you have set up auto scaling, which is great, even though auto scaling can take sometimes a bit a bit of time, you know, or you didn't, and your server could be over overloaded. So you get a lot of traffic, and everything starts to actually get slower and slower, and your server is really slow. Uh, with Lambda, the way it scales, it will boot new containers on the fly. So you, the worst you get are those cold starts, which may be. 300 milliseconds. Yeah. And to me, it's a balance of are you ready to accept that in exchange mm. for being able to scale and support any kind of traffic? So, um, yeah, there's a trade off here. Uh, and people, yeah, th and there are ways that you can you can engineer around that, yeah. or there are ways that AWS allow you to, to eliminate the cold starts. For me, you're right. It's a slider, right? It's a slider where you can you can eliminate cold starts entirely, but you're gonna chew through your your generous million invocation free tier a lot quicker if you're not taking advantage of cold starts, right? So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's fine. Look, in the real world, I really feel like if you if you go to a random website, a single page application, um, and for example, if in this situation you load up the HTML, which could be in an S in an S3 bucket. So it's a static website. So the actual HTML Chrome of your website, assuming you're doing an SPA, which most people are in these days, even though they don't need to be, that's an argument for another day, um, is, you know, your Chrome is loaded. There's this tiny cold start on one, the first request response cycle. 
People are used to sitting there waiting for spinners on the, for their web page to, to load up anyway in this modern era. I, I just don't see this as being a problem for the for the actual benefits you get. Like, you literally have to do nothing to get automatic scaling. Like, nothing at all. You just use Lambda as your web host and it just scales for you. I mean, it's just amazing to me. Yeah, and um, usually when you have a look at websites, like you say, single page applications, the time it takes to load the whole page is usually more than a few seconds. Yeah. Uh, whereas a cold start is a few hundred, uh, yeah. hundred minutes. So Char Charlie B6 says, I'm currently building a Slack app where I have to respond in three yeah. seconds. This is maybe not a good use for this. Um, in all honesty, I think it's a perfectly good use for it because tons of Slack apps are all using Lambda. Like funct anything that's involving webhooks or um, that kind of stuff, Function as a service is an amazing fit for webhooks, and, and Lambda is an amazing fit for stuff like Slack bots and Slack apps. Yeah, I think we are talking hundreds of milliseconds here, not seconds. Let's remember that as well. I mean, depending on how your app is written and stuff, but typically it's that. So